Oh uh -huh. 
Thank you that you died for us. It's amazing. We just want to say we love you, Lord, and we welcome you here into this place. Thank you so much that you have died in our place so that we might have forgiveness. Praise your name, Lord. And we want to bring our prayers to you tonight in the light of that incredible truth that nothing and no one has ever overcome you. You are the Prince of Life. You are the hope of the world. And we pray to you tonight in that knowledge. So Lord Jesus, we bring to you all of the troubles of the world. It's, it seems too much, but we think of a place now which is war-torn and full of misery. There's quite a few to choose from. But we just bring that before you in our hearts and our minds now. And Lord, we ask your healing and your grace and your mercy. Lord, nearer to home, we, we thank you for the amazing work that's going on through the ministry of this church. We thank you for the work you're doing in schools and in the hospital and in the prison, Lord. Lord, we love what's going on in the prison. It's just amazing to see you at work. 
your hand rescuing people who thought they were too far gone. We just love that, Jesus, and we praise you for it. Would you do more of your work there? Would you release your spirit fully in that prison, we pray? Would you just burst open the doors of darkness and bring more light and joy to that place? Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name. And Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the opportunity to join together in your name, the most beautiful, powerful name that there has ever been and ever will be. And we just want to ask you to, to bless everything that's going on here. Simon, the team, the worship, the outreach, everything, Lord. Would you, would you take our offering and multiply it and help us to be bold, Lord, bold to share that amazing truth that you died for us. That is just the most valuable thing this world has ever seen or ever will see. So help us not to keep it to ourselves, Lord. Be, help us to be instruments and vessels of your goodness and your truth. Instruments where there is hatred to bring love, where there is injury to bring pardon, where there is doubt to bring faith, where there is despair to bring hope, where there is darkness to bring light. And where there is sorrow, Lord, to bring joy, we pray joy over, over those people that we meet and everyone that we encounter. And Jesus, would you give us radical encounters with other people this week? Would you give us the opportunity to share that? Just stir the ground, Lord. Prepare it. Prepare the hearts of those that we come across. That We might not keep this to ourselves, but we would be a, a vibrant people who are just desperate to tell other people about this amazing treasure that we have. So Jesus, would you help us in that, we ask. And Lord, finally, for, for anyone who's sick that we know who's unwell, in mind or body, we bring them before you now. And we do ask for healing, the healing grace. Lord, I think of, of my sister, Nikki, who's suffering with mouth cancer. And I saw her this morning, Lord, and I just... The, the, the devastation that brings. And I just pray for healing on that woman. I pray for healing for her heart, for her mouth, for her spirit, for her husband. And Lord, we just ask you to pour out your goodness in that family. And for other people that we know who are sick, they need your touch. So our Father, Join me if you wish. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
We thank you that you are here with us and we praise you with thanksgiving for all that you have done and all that you will do. And Lord, as we think about your risen son, about the risen Jesus this evening, we thank you again that Jesus is alive. Thank you that that isn't just a last Sunday, Easter Sunday kind of thing, but that Jesus is alive today, yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. And we just pray tonight that we can live with hope and with joy. Um, a hope and joy such as in the words of, of 1 Peter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, 
which says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Amen. Amen. Please do sit down. Thank you, band. Awesome. Well, very good evening to you all and welcome uh, to Christ Church Winchester. It's great to have you with us uh, for our service tonight. Uh, my name's Louise uh, and I'm on the staff team here. Um, and so a big welcome from me this evening, especially um, if you're new or if you're a guest or a visitor. Uh, it's great to have you along with us as well. Um, if you'd like this service to Related uh, into a different language, if that's more helpful and more accessible uh, for you, then you can download the Microsoft Translate app uh, and pop in the code on the screen. Thanks, Tim. If you can pop that up, that would be great. There we are. Um, I'm running it off my phone. If it stops working, let me know um, and we'll try and work it out. So I hope you've had um, a great week uh, since Easter Sunday, uh, and this evening we're going to explore more of the Easter story together. Uh, Simon is going to speak to us uh, from Luke chapter 24, uh, the first part of this wonderful conversation that Jesus has uh, with two disciples, and they are wrapped up in sadness and chaos and confusion uh, after the death of their promised saviour, but it is the most wonderful conversation. Um, so we'll be looking forward to Simon unpacking that for us a little bit later on. Um, firstly, I've welcomed you to church, but I'd love you to welcome each other. So just for a couple of minutes, uh, find someone new, say hello, uh, and welcome them to church tonight. Awesome. If I can gather you back together, it's great to see people turning around and, and even walking across the room. Jamie, I'm Jenny, I'm loving that. Um, no, it's great to see you interacting with people that you don't know, because uh, church is a family, and so we've got to um, yeah, put effort uh, into it being that way. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, just before Fiona comes to read and Simon comes to preach, we're going to watch a video from Open Doors, a charity uh, that supports persecuted Christians uh, across the world who live in places uh, where their faith has a real cost to them. Um, faith has a cost to each of us, uh, but for our Christian brothers and sisters across the world, uh, for some of them, the cost uh, is very, very different uh, to what we have uh, here in the UK. So um, if we could have that video, thank you, Tim. We have a lot of money that we have to take away from the country and we are forced to take away from the country. We don't want to take away from the country, but we are forced to take away from the country.
علوم پزشکی خودش منو اخراج کرد حتی قبل از صدور حکم تمام 18 سال سابقه کاری منو نادیده گرفتن و منو به خاطر ایمان به عیسی مسیح اخراج کردن یه روز گرمه خیلی تابستونی ساعت شیش و نیم صبح بود که دیدیم در رو میزند و ازشون خواهش کردم که به اجازه بدن کسی رو پیدا کنم که بتونن بچه رو بهشون بسپارم ولی قبول نکردم نگران بودم و همش دعا میکردم و میگفتم که خدایا ایسای مسیح تو این بچه رو به من دادی و تو خودت این بچه رو برای من محافظت کن و این بچه رو به من برگردون الان توی جایی که هستیم خب هنوز به اون شرایط استیبل نرسیدیم و توی شرایط خیلی سختی هستیم ولی خب از این که خداوند داره به عنوان یه مادر یه همسر تو این شرایط سخت از من استفاده میکنه و من میتونم که به زنهای دیگری که اونا هم توی شرایط سخت هستن مثل من خدمت کنم و بهشون کمک کنم خیلی خوشحالم و استف... است... احساس میکنم که آدم بی استفاده این نیستم در این شرایط که خدا داره از من استفاده میکنه از این طریق که بتونم اون به زنهایی که قلبهاشون شکسته و خوبیتشون رو جمهوری اسلامی پایمال کرده بتونم کمک کنم We just spend a moment praying for um, our persecuted family uh, across the world. Yeah, loving God, uh, we thank you that we can worship freely here. Um, but Lord, I pray uh, that we would um, not take that for granted. Lord, would we not forget uh, our sisters and brothers uh, across the world who are uh, meeting in secret, who are uh, meeting in danger. Um, but I thank you for their faith. We thank you that they have counted the cost and that they have realized that you are worth it all. Lord, would you strengthen them? Uh, would you encourage them? Um, may they, uh, by your spirit, know uh, that you are so closely with them uh, and walking alongside them. Um, and we thank you for Simin and, and her ministry. Um, and we pray for her today. Uh, may she know your presence uh, deeply uh, within her and alongside her. Um, yeah, would you strengthen her ministry? Uh, would you expand it? Um, and may other uh, people like her come to know you as their savior. Yeah, Lord, may we learn uh, from our persecuted brothers and sisters. Uh, may we remember them in our prayers um, and in the way that we worship too. Yeah, we just commit that to you, uh, Lord God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Awesome. Fiona uh, is going to read our reading from us, uh, for us, sorry, and uh, Simon will come to unpack it. Our reading this evening is from Luke 24, verses 13 to 27. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, 
it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Fiona, very much indeed. Um, it would certainly help me if you kept your Bibles open at uh, Luke 24, because uh, you are going to re refer to it in a number of different ways. Uh, a couple of things as we set sail in this sermon. First one, just want you to think very quickly about that one thing in your childhood which you just couldn't bear to eat. So the thing that appeared on your dinner plate and your heart sank and you just thought, I cannot eat that for love nor money. So just store that thought away because we're going to come back to it. Second one is, this is such a profound story, it is incredibly easy to enter the world of the story and to be, uh, in a sense, using our imaginations to be entranced and moved uh, and to have our own walk with Jesus deepened uh, just through listening to this story and putting ourselves into it and engaging with it. And so towards the end of my sermon, I want to suggest a couple of ways in which each of us, coming from very different points of view, might want to sort of slot ourselves into, that, into this story. So do please kind of keep your ears open uh, for those. So if you were here last week, you'll remember that in verse 12 of Luke 24, uh, basically all chaos has uh, let loose. Uh, the stone is rolled away. There's no body of Jesus in the tomb. There are a bunch of angels saying Jesus isn't here. And there's the promise, or if you like, there's the smell of resurrection in the air. That something deeply, profoundly important has happened, but there's no sign of Jesus as yet. We know from the first chapter of Acts, we know that Luke knows lots of stories about the resurrection. So Luke, who wrote this gospel, Luke's gospel, also wrote Acts, which is like his uh, part two, uh, the sequel. And if you look at verse three of chapter one, Luke says this, he says, after his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So we know from that that Luke, through his really careful research, knew a lot of stories about the resurrection. The main one that he gives to us in Luke 24 in his gospel is this one. And we heard the first half of it tonight. We're going to look at the second half of it next week. So all those stories he knew, this was the one that for Luke was absolutely important. And remember too that in terms of timelines, we are still on the first Easter Sunday evening. So it's only this morning, so to speak, uh, that the tomb was found uh, empty and uh, with the, the stone rolled away. So a lot has happened in a short time. It's now that Sunday evening and that's when our, uh, our characters appear. Two main questions to ask about this passage. The first one is, well, who are these two disciples who are walking from Jerusalem back to Emmaus? Well, if you look at verse 18, uh, Luke names one of them, and he names them Cleopas. He doesn't name the other, and we don't know why he doesn't know the other. Maybe everybody knew in the early church who it was. Maybe uh, nobody knew or someone couldn't remember. We don't know why he didn't include the name. There is an interesting reference that we can go sniffing after, and that is in John 19, in John's description of the cross. And in John 19, verse 25, John records, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
So did you pick up that Clopas? So there was a woman called Mary, whose husband was Clopas, who was stood at the foot of the cross. Some people think that Clopas, husband of Mary, standing courageously and faithfully at the foot of the cross, is the same as our Cleopas here in Luke 24. It's certainly possible, but we don't know. What we do know is this. These two disciples are crushed in spirit. That's the important thing. That's what we need to know. Look at their reaction in verse 17. Uh, When Jesus kind of just joins them along the road, asks them what's going on, they stood still, their faces downcast. They've been walking along, they meet this guy, he asks them this very simple, open-ended question, and immediately they stop, and their heads go down, and they, to begin with, can't even speak uh, because they are so traumatized by what has happened. They weren't part of the the little group of 12 disciples, but they were close enough to Jesus to feel the weight, to feel the disappointment of his death this deeply. We also know that they were courageous because to talk openly with a stranger on the road just outside Jerusalem three days after the crucifixion of Jesus, was still a brave thing to do, one that could have backfired on them. Think what had happened, or nearly happened, to Peter just four days previously when someone in the courtyard had said to him, aren't you a friend of Jesus? And think about all that happened then. These disciples at least have the courage to, in a sense, to say openly, it's, it's the death of Jesus That is the reason why we are so downcast. Last of all, one, one of the other things we know about them is that they're going the wrong way. They are walking away from Jerusalem towards a little village called Emmaus. Perhaps Emmaus was where they lived. Perhaps it was a, a stopping point on the place to where they lived. But in their minds, Cleopas and whoever he was traveling with, Jesus is dead. The game is over. They can't even hear good news in those first wild reports that the tomb is empty and that the body's gone. To them, it just feels like further humiliation. They're thinking they wouldn't even leave Jesus alone in his death. Now someone's stolen the body. Now, you're going to have to wait till next week to see what happens at the end of the story unless you can't resist reading to the end of the passage before then. But the question that dominates this first part of the passage, to my mind, is this. Why didn't they recognize the stranger on the road as Jesus? That's the question that's been gripping me. There they are, they're on the road, this guy joins them. Why don't they recognize that it's Jesus? I want to dig into that for most of our time together. Uh, Luke gives us some really helpful clues. In verse 16, he says, they were kept from recognizing him. They were kept from recognizing him, suggesting that it was something that God was doing in that moment. Then in verse 31, that we'll look at in more detail next week, we read, then their eyes were opened. It's not that Jesus looked totally different. It wasn't that Jesus had been fitted out with some new ID post-resurrection or that there was some sort of weird first century witness protection thing going on. Jesus is still the same. Luke and John tell us that he showed his disciples the scars of his sacrifice. This is God's doing and it's God's timing. They are not yet ready to see Jesus. So their lack of recognition of him, they've had this conversation with him, they've listened to that same voice, they've seen that same outline on the road. Their lack of recognition is symbolic of their spiritual blindness. There are things that they need to learn, that they need to appreciate, that they need to understand Uh, before they can comprehend that Jesus is risen. It's really interesting to me that Luke uses this same language of things being hidden 
or things being kept from the disciples on two other occasions in his gospel. And they both link really importantly to this one. First one is in Luke 9, uh, verse 45, where Luke writes, it was hidden from them. It was hidden from them. What was hidden from them? What was hidden from them was, was Jesus' prediction that the Son of Man would be betrayed. So that's quite early on in Luke, and that's one of the first times Jesus talks about this openly, and Luke says that it was hidden from them. They couldn't yet understand what was going on. Then at nine chapters later, in chapter 18, verse 34, Luke records, its meaning was hidden from them. It there is this uh, Jesus' fuller prediction that the Son of Man would be handed over and we would be, be betrayed and would be killed and would then rise again. So twice in Luke's Gospel, twice before uh, Luke 24, twice, uh, Jesus has spoken about his death. And the meaning of what he's talking about, the, the heart of it, the depths of it, have been hidden from his disciples. It wasn't something that they could, they could understand the words, but they couldn't understand what he was talking about because it just did not fit with the way that they saw the world. So all along, this suffering of the Messiah, the cross, this is the sticking point. Think back to that piece of food that you didn't want to eat on your child's plate. For me, without question, swede, mashed swede. I love it now, but when I was six, literally, I thought it was, it was like created by Beelzebub himself. It just it smelt bad, tasted terrible, looked horrible, all, 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 you know, just, it was all, all, all wrong. That was the thing for me. Maybe you love swede, but I guarantee there was something something in your life that you didn't want to eat when it hit your plate. And that's the thing for the disciples. This is the thing that they cannot swallow. They cannot swallow that the Messiah, they couldn't swallow it before, and they can't swallow it immediately after. They cannot swallow that the Messiah had to suffer and to die. It was just impossible for them to accept. Let's dig a little deeper into that because there's some really important things here. The first one to say is that Jesus continued both now but also before his death, continued to look ordinary, remarkably so, just as he'd, as he'd always done. We saw this in our Emmaus uh, Rewind series when we thought about Isaiah 53. Verse 2 we read, He had no beauty no majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Mary doesn't recognize Jesus in the garden, though it is dark and she's weeping, nor do the disciples on the shores of Galilee. There isn't yet in Jesus the radiant glory of his ascended body. We get a tiny glimpse of it in Acts uh, as uh, Jesus rises, we get a full glimpse of it in Revelation, as in a sense the curtains uh, of heaven are, are pulled back just for a moment uh, for us. But now, post-resurrection, there is still a fundamental ordinariness, ordinariness about Jesus. So the disciples, when they see him on the road, there's not, there's not light pouring out of him. There aren't heavenly angels following him on the road. He's just an ordinary person as he always was. This is not, Luke 24 is not how a made-up story of the resurrected Jesus would go. A made-up story would have Jesus instantly recognized and hailed as the risen Christ, no questions asked. The reason I say that is because uh, there are made-up stories of the resurrected Jesus that were written about a hundred years after uh, the Luke's gospel was written. And the most famous of these are the so-called gospels of Peter and Thomas. And in the gospel of Peter that was written, say, about 150 AD, so a long time after the New Testament, here is how Jesus' resurrection is described. 
When Jesus comes out of the tomb, he is already described as being taller than the sky, and next to him, he has a talking cross. And the talking cross tells everybody what Jesus has achieved. That is a made-up resurrection story. In the real Gospels, we have ordinary Jesus on the road. We have confusion. We have blindness. We have fear. And we have disbelief. No one made this up. This is how it happened. But the heart of their blindness was that Jesus still had much to teach them. There was more that they needed to grasp. Listen to Cleopas in verse 19. This, was, this is Cleopas' summary of what he had hoped for Jesus. Cleopas says, He was a prophet, we agree. Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, we agree. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now that's where Cleopas hasn't thought deeply or big enough. Cleopas's view is this. If Jesus has come to redeem Israel, he should be defeating pagan Romans and not dying at their hands. Or he might have said, we want to be released from slavery to Rome and slavery to a corrupt temple just as Israel was rescued from Egypt back in the Exodus. Cleopas wants an end to occupation. He's thinking economic. He's thinking political. He's thinking circumstantial. He wasn't thinking deeply enough. He wasn't thinking big enough. That's why he can't yet see the risen Jesus. That's why Jesus needs to take him back to the Old Testament scriptures as we saw through Lent in our Emmaus Rewind series. And when Jesus summarizes what Cleopas has got wrong, he simply says, did not the Christ have to suffer these things? That's his point. Uh, just as they couldn't in Luke 9 and in Luke 18, the disciples could not yet grasp or they could not yet swallow that humanity's need was so great and so deep that the only solution, the only thing that would break our slavery and that would bring us freedom was that the Son of God himself, when he came to earth, would go all the way to the cross and would die and would suffer in our place. That was what they couldn't get their heads around. Uh, listen again. Uh, Cleopas said, they crucified him. Talking about the authorities. They crucified him, which to Cleopas on that day felt like a disastrous end to a promising life. They crucified him, he says, but we had hoped. We'd hoped that he would redeem Israel. And Jesus completely takes this apart. And Jesus, in a sense, rewrites this for him. So that instead of saying, they crucified him, but we had hoped, their thinking is going to have to change. And the thinking is now going to be, they crucified him and, not but, they crucified him and, that was always how God had planned it. The Old Testament is not a long story of God redeeming Israel from suffering. It's a long story of God redeeming the whole world through Israel's suffering, which becomes Jesus' suffering. There was always a deeper, greater prize. And that prize was of me and you having things put right with God through Jesus. And we hear it, we hear the echo all the way back in Genesis 12, in the promise to Abraham. Do you remember what Abraham was promised? One of the things he was promised is this, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It was always the plan. Many of us are, uh, would recognize this uh, picture, uh, this uh, strong image of going on a journey with Jesus. And as we finish, I just want to, in a sense, to suggest 
three different points of the journey uh, that you might find yourself on. I may not get it exactly right for you, uh, but listen in and see which is the one that best mirrors or best explains where you are. Some of us are on, a, on our really early steps of this walk. In fact, and, and they're so early that you're not even sure that Jesus is with you. You're not even sure that he's there. Life is pointless, is, is the big feeling at this stage of the journey. It, it, it feels like even a clear pass is with, with, is with one other person, but he still feels alone. He's downcast. Everything has gone wrong. He doesn't know what to do. And quite a few people who start coming to our church feel exactly like that. Life is pointless. You're trudging on alone. You don't know where you're going and what you're doing. A great prayer, if you are in that situation, is simply to say, Jesus, show me where you are. Because I believe, having read this story, that Jesus is already walking right alongside you. You might not have seen him yet. You might not have heard him yet. You might not be ready to. But a great prayer is simply to say, Jesus, show me where you are. I need your hand. I need your voice. I need to hear you speak to me. And that could be you. You might be a little further on the journey. You've been walking uh, with Jesus for a while. And for those of us in that situation, the journey is sometimes, although not always, is sometimes the journey is, goes from, uh, it's, it starts with being a sufferer, for, from being downcast as Cleopas and uh, his companion are at the start of the journey, being in despair that things are pointless, but we move on from that to knowing that there is a deeper need that has yet to be met. And I certainly remember moving from being someone who'd had some things that were difficult and that I needed to get my head around to realizing that I was somebody who was a sinner who needed a new heart. And that's a far deeper thing than coming to God and saying, there are some things that I'd like you to sort out. What the disciples, Cleopas and his companion, realize is that Jesus' rescue is deeper, and it's more radical, and it's more demanding than they first thought. They start the journey downcast that this great prophet, who they thought was a hero, was dead. Jesus had to tell them, Firmly, Jesus wasn't just a great prophet. He was the Son of God who had come to suffer and to die in our place in the way that God had always planned. It's deeper. It's more radical. It's more demanding. And if that's where you are, if you're just beginning to move from, uh, I've experienced some things that are difficult to a, a deeper realization that not only your heart but every single heart needs to be changed and transformed and liberated don't stop now push harder keep going open your heart and your life uh, to Christ uh, because he longs to do that deep radical work uh, in each one of us Lastly, it may be that you're, you're a, even a tiny bit further on from that. Uh, you're ready to hear from Jesus. You would echo uh, what the disciples said. Were not our hearts burning within us as they heard Jesus talk? And, and you, you've heard Jesus speak. And you know that when you listen and when you set other things aside, that he is true. He does deserve our worship. He does deserve all our honor and obedience. You know those things. You've met him in the breaking of bread, be it the hospitality of a home or the breaking of bread here in church. We see him now. And we begin to know him now. 
but we see him not as a failed hero, which is how Cleopas started. He's not a failed hero, but he's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the Messiah who walked the way that his father prepared for him in love, but is now risen in glory. We'll see next week that this is the time, this is the moment when we know that gladly to drop everything and run back to Jerusalem without giving too much away. That's what Cleopas and his friend do. Seven miles all the way back to Jerusalem once they, their eyes are opened and they see who Jesus is. This is the time. This is the moment when we've made that transition, when we've seen the risen Jesus in all of his glory. We then say, the kingdom has come. There are people to tell that we serve a risen Savior. There are new lives of hope to be lived. There are other people to be called out of slavery into the wonderful light of the Savior. And if that's you, then get up and get going. Jesus has things for you to do. He doesn't want you sitting around and talking about it for too long. He wants you out there serving, loving, sharing all that you have experienced of his risen glory. So three possible places where you might insert yourself into that story. Early steps. You, you don't even know that Jesus is there. Tell him. Show yourself. Reach out to me. It, it may be more that you're a little bit further on and you're just beginning to see at that maybe you've miscalculated about Jesus, that the rescue that he offers, that the diagnosis about what is wrong with us as human beings is deeper and more radical than you thought. Keep going. That's what Jesus does. He challenges, he provokes, he peels back at the layers of spiritual blindness. And if you've begun to, got, to get it, and you've begun to hear him, then take a leaf out of dear clear pass and whoever it was who was with him, take a leaf out of their book and let it energize you and let it send you and let it enthuse you as his disciples in this world that is still broken and that is still downcast and needs Jesus' love every day. Amen. I'd invite you, if, if you're comfortable, to just close your eyes uh, for a moment as the band begin to um, play over us. And in the quiet, in, in the darkness that our closed eyes bring, um, I wonder, shall we just reflect on where we feel that we are on that journey? Where out of those three places that Simon laid out for us? so well where where do we fit where do we see ourselves let's reflect on that in our own hearts with jesus right now as we maybe begin to see where we might place ourselves and, and our own faith. Why don't we start in our, in our hearts to pray the prayers that, that Simon encouraged us to pray, depending on where we are on that journey. And in each place of that journey, we can of course pray that Jesus would help us turn our eyes towards him more and more.
in a moment we are going to sing. But as we sing, there'll be people over uh, in the side of the room uh, who would love to pray with you. Whatever is going on in your hearts and your minds as you reflect, uh, we would love to be with you in prayer and and help you uh, give that to God this evening. Um, So do come forward, uh, don't be shy, or just turn um, around to someone. um, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to pray with you. Um, So feel free to stay seated and and keep reflecting uh, in that way if you'd like, or um, otherwise, uh, please do stand uh, as you're able uh, as we sing.
was speaking um, and mentioned that phrase. Um, uh, but we had hope being in the past tense. Um, I really felt that that was um, ringing true for somebody this evening, that, that that hope were, had been there, but it had gone, that it had faded away in the same way that the hope had faded away for those disciples who um, thought that the, the story had ended. Um, so if that's you and, and you feel like that, that, that hope is gone and that it's, it's not resurrectable, uh, I just want to say that it is. And I, just, uh, I would love to encourage you to go and pray with somebody for that, that hope um, to return. As we were worshipping, I just had a picture of someone waking up in the morning and just rubbing their eyes and the image still being really blurry. And I felt God was saying that for some of us, we're like that when it comes to recognising Jesus. We've rubbed our eyes, but it's still a little bit blurry. And so we need to do something. So in the morning, we rub our eyes again and something happens. So if you need to physically respond to what Jesus is saying to you tonight, then step forward ask someone to pray with you maybe you need to rub your eyes and just see that God is there that it is Jesus who's speaking to you
God, lead us into deeper and higher praise uh, of you in our song, but also as we love, as we live, as we seek to be your hands and feet, to be Jesus in the places where we go. We thank you that you opened the eyes of those two people on that road, that it was encounter with you and scripture that helped them to see the story of your salvation for us. And we pray that you would continue to open our eyes to see you more and to know you more and to help others be invited in to have their eyes opened to to have their lives changed to have salvation for themselves too we thank you for all that you've done here this evening and all that you will continue to do as we leave. And just like Simon in our video, I pray that we would know that you are worth everything. May we know what it means to put you first to count the cost and to know that you are worth our everything because of who you are and because of what you did in your life and in your death and in your resurrection, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. We always like to spend some time at the end of our services thanking uh, our church family for the generosity uh, that, you, that you give, the, the ways that you give uh, in your prayers and financially and with your time uh, to support the ministries going on here at Christchurch, um, in the city and further afield. Um, it's a joy to hear about what God is doing uh, and the people that he is bringing to faith, uh, the things that he's doing in people's lives as they encounter him uh, through the different things that, that we're involved in. Um, so thank you so much uh, for all of your giving. Um, Jack in our email often writes good news stories uh, of what God is doing around this place and, and further afield. So if you want to um, yeah, hear what God is up to uh, through your giving, um, please do sign up uh, to the weekly email. We also know uh, that people are facing financial struggles at the moment. So if you or someone that you know needs help financially, uh, these are two great places uh, to either get in touch with or to point people to. That's the Early Church Fund uh, and Winchester Basics Bank. We are going to just read a piece of scripture, uh, which is from when people are coming to John uh, to be baptized, and they, it's crowds of people, and they're saying, what should we do? Um, and he answers with these words. Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. It's the call on our lives as disciples to be generous and to give uh, and to change the lives of people when we can. Uh, so why don't you join me uh, in this prayer um, to cement that in our hearts this evening. Loving God, through the expression of grace, your son came not to be served, but to serve. Nurture in us generous hearts that in words and action, your glory may be revealed. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things to let you know about. Um, as it's still the Easter holidays, most of our groups uh, are paused still uh, until next week. But there is a worship gathering uh, tomorrow night. Jack, I haven't asked you, but I wonder if you'd just share a little bit uh, about the worship gathering tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Yes, I can. Thanks. So um, every two months, our worship and production teams gather 
um, usually in this space, depends on how cold it is, um, <laughs> to uh, basically pray together to get to know each other. Um, we're often all together in different configurations on Sundays. So it's a good place if you are part of one of those teams to come along to get to know people, but also if you have a passion for worship or have creative worship skills such as poetry or art. I know Kevin is really keen to um, find ways for us to express those as a community. So do join us tomorrow night, eight o'clock. Great. I know the topic tomorrow is pressing in, um, so do come and press in uh, to what God has for you uh, tomorrow night. Um, other than that, uh, we're going to sing to close, so uh, if you're able, please do stand, and we're going to sing um, about the marvellous love uh, that Jesus had for us, um, so please do stand. Thank you.
I thank you that as we look to the cross that we see a picture of, of love there. And we pray that we would too be people of love in a world that feels really broken. May we carry your love to those around us. May we carry your hope, your joy and your peace to those that we meet. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us now and remain with us always. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, if you want to chat to anyone about where you feel like you fit on that road, um, that would be great. Just reach out to, to someone or, or one of the team uh, and we'd love to chat through that with you. Um, but thanks for joining and we'll see you next week. <laughs>